I'm DJ Jones, and I'm an active birder here in the Meta Valley. I'm on the North um, North Central Washington Audubon Board, um, and I help coordinate field trips with another person. Um, I'm super excited to have you all here at the Winthrop Library and on Zoom to welcome our evening speaker, Eric Heisey. Um, I was first introduced to Eric nearly 10 years ago at a Washington Ornithological Society conference in Ocean Shores, where Eric was co-leading a field trip. I have been in awe of his, Eric's natural ability, natural birding eyes and ears, and his ability to inspire and connect with others and share his passions. We've been fortunate to have Eric lead several field trips for our local chapter, and I look forward to many or more opportunities in the future, <laughs> as many as possible. <laughs> We've um, Eric is a true naturalist. He has a deep love and understanding of the world we live in and how human impacts have and continue to change our landscapes and the biodiversity within them. His life journey has already taken him to numerous continents to study and research. He's here tonight to share his recent travels to Peru and Kenya. Please join me in welcoming Eric, also known as Mr. Bird Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, DJ. Um, wow, I think this is the first time I've used a microphone. Um, uh, yeah, moving up in the world. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm Eric. Uh, I'm a big bird nerd uh, and a nerd about other things in nature as well. Um, so I'm here to talk to you largely about my travels um, in Peru and Kenya, but I'll give you first a quick little kind of background on some of the work I've done and uh, you know who I am. Um, if this will work. Um, so this, uh, this was me on my first field job. Uh, I've previously worked on Savannah sparrows, which is what the bird that I've got in my hand here. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Savannah sparrows, um, at the University of Guelph as an undergraduate. Um, after graduating, um, in 2020, I have worked with many different um, kind of endangered birds and animals. Um, I've worked in southeastern Oregon and uh, Nevada with greater sage grouse. This was my first time holding a male greater sage grouse. It's pretty awesome. Um, I've worked in uh, in Madagascar studying critically endangered herpetofauna. Um, this is the largest ever recorded individual of this species of gecko. It's over a foot long. Um, so naturally I had to put it on my face. Um, this was also in Madagascar. This is a Parson chameleon, the largest chameleon in the world. Um, later that year, this was 2022. Uh, I worked as a backpacking guide at Yosemite National Park and an outdoor educator, um, guiding largely groups of high school kids around Yosemite. Um, I've also worked in Washington as an outdoor educator um, for many years. This was a trip that I led last year in the Goat Rocks in uh, like Yakima County area. Um, there's Mount Adams in the background. Um, I've TA'd uh, university field courses. This one was in Peru, uh, where it's in the same region that I will be talking about tonight. Um, there are very big trees there. Um, this is a tree called Seba Pentandra, which is one of the largest trees in the world. They are truly gigantic. Um, but last year, um, I worked a little less and I traveled a lot and I saw a lot of birds. Um, this is my eBird wrapped from last year. So I last year traveled to Ecuador, Nepal, Canada, very far away. Um, I did a road trip around the U S. Um, I spent the summer working in Montana. Um, and then I went to Peru and Kenya, and it added up to almost 2,000 species of birds last year, which is pretty cool. Um, here it is, as I mentioned Nepal. Here's a, oh, these videos. It's playing fine on my computer, but clearly it's not translated super well. You get an idea. Um, I was in the Himalayas. It was pretty cool. <laughs> There's some big mountains there. Lots of really cool birds there, too. Um, this was, we'll see if this one works. Um, this was uh, 
in my, at my summer job in Montana. Um, this was uh, a few minutes before I had to sprint two miles back to my car uh, to uh, the, uh, avoid a lightning storm. Um, I now have a much deeper respect for lightning <laughs> than I did previously. Um, uh, but it was very beautiful. Uh, I don't know if you probably can't hear the audio, but there's a lot of birds. Um, there's the storm that I had to run from. Um, I worked in Glacier and Yellowstone National Park last year. This is another work site that I was at um, surveying birds at the same work site. I did found out for their goshawk nests. Um, but really what I'm passionate about is the tropics. And I hope in the future to work primarily in the New World tropics. Um, I have done most of my prior work in Peru, especially in this area. This is southeastern Peru. This area that's outlined is called Madre de Dios, um, which translates to Mother of God. Um, and uh, this is one of the better kind of like explored regions of Peru, um, research-wise. But it is uh, amongst it is perhaps the most biodiverse region on the globe. There's a huge national park here called Manu National Park. Um, which I'll talk about a bit more, which may be the most biodiverse national park on the planet. Um, so yeah, this is kind of where I was this fall for three months. I was right about here, um, roughly. This, you see this uh, line here, this is the interoceanic highway. Um, so all along that line of deforestation is a big road. Um, we'll talk more about deforestation later, but now you kind of have an idea of where I, was um so in peru there are many birds i'm just going to jump right into um pictures um so this is one of the most emblematic birds of peru i think this is actually the, the national bird of peru um uh, this is called the andean cock of the rock it is a species of cotinga um which is a family of neotropical birds that are really beautiful and bizarre they do a ridiculous dance um, they kind of sound like, uh, I don't even know what you, they sound like, kind of like a, like dying cat. Um, and they all dance around like in a circle and, uh, the males do this dance where they clap their wings behind their, their heads and kind of go up and down, bobbing around until a female comes. And then they all dance even more energetically. And the female basically just comes to these, they're called lex, just like sage grouse. Um, and they check out to see which male is the most worthy of their love. And so the males dance to try and impress the females. And uh, I, I've been impressed when I've seen them. So I imagine the, the females are pretty impressed too. Um, another charismatic bird. This is the same species that um, I had on the screen at first. Um, these are um, blue and yellow macaws. There are many species of macaws in Peru. Um, the area that I was working at, I was doing, by the way, I didn't really say what I was doing for work. I was doing a bird inventory of this project, of this uh, survey that was run by a, a nonprofit um, to kind of identify um, which species are present on the property and just kind of get a baseline of what's there. It's a property that's being reforested um, and uh, is undergoing a lot of change all around it. So I wanted to kind of start a long-term study to see how bird um, life changes there over time. As uh, the, the property is reforested, half of the property was historically completely deforested. Um, and as the land use around the property changes. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk more about that kind of work um, more towards the end, but for now, I'm just going to kind of go through and show a bunch of pictures of cool stuff because I think that's probably more interesting than um, hearing me talk about what I was doing for work. Um, here's another species of macaw. These are um, called uh, chestnut fronted macaws. They all macaws just like absolutely scream um, when they're flying over. Um, so sometimes you'll be like walking through the beautiful, quiet forest in the middle of the day. And then out of nowhere, there'll be like this screaming noise like right over your head that'll kind of make you jump. But they're quite beautiful once you kind of accustom, uh, acclimate to the, the fact that they are in fact birds that are making the screaming noise. It's kind of like a barn owl. So like the first time you hear it, you're a little bit like, 
what was that? <laughs> but macaws are um, quite colorful and beautiful. As are toucans. Toucans are very common, um, as are macaws in the area that I've been working in. Um, this is a white-throated toucan. They sound basically like a yappy puppy dog, um, and uh, they're pretty cool. They largely eat fruit, um, though, though they do eat um, like eggs of other birds and uh, lizards. They're actually quite predatory, but they do they do mostly eat fruit. This is not working to go to the next bird. There we go. Uh, this is another species of toucan. This is called a chestnut-eared arasari. Um, which is another common species of toucan in this area. They're quite ornately colored. Similar to toucans, they're quite opportunistic in what they eat, but they're a little bit smaller. So I think they, they're they especially um, kind of reliant on food or fruit and uh, insects and smaller animals. Um, this is my favorite bird um, in the world, I would say. Uh, this is called the agami heron. Um, if you're a... Uh, birder maybe you've heard lore of this bird that's one of it's one of the harder birds in the world to see um because they are very secretive um and on this particular occasion i was very lucky i was on a canoe uh in a lake um in Monty national park and um i was able to get right up close to watch this individual fishing um and i got to watch it catch about i think 10 fish before i finally decided i was going to leave it alone but it, it was spectacular, certainly one of the highlights of my bird watching life. Um, there are many species of cool herons in South America. This is a rufescent tiger heron, named such because of the tiger kind of tiger striping on the on the feathers. Um, I'm realizing this screen's a bit lower quality um, picture than my computer, but hopefully it's kind of translating all right. Um, there. You know, they're a heron. They hide and catch fish, just like many other herons. Um, there are many other um, owls in, in South America that we don't have here in North America. The One of the coolest ones is called the spectacled owl. Um, they sound kind of like if you were to take a big sheet of foil and, like, wave it around. That's kind of how they sound, if you could imagine that. Um, they're really cool. We were lucky to to um, flush this individual off of a day roost while we were doing a big day for Global Big Ebert's Global Big Day. I don't know if you know all know what a big day is. It'll come up again later. But a big day is when you go out for a day and try and see as many species as you can in one day. A good day, um, the state record for Washington is about 212 species, I believe. Um, on foot in Peru on a very quiet, dry, um, day we were able to find 195 species of birds um, just walking around this 50 hectare property. So the diversity, even in the disturbed um, forest in Peru, is quite spectacular. Um, just on this property, um, again, it's 50 hectare property. I've seen 367 species of birds now, um, which is about as many as I've seen in the entire state of Washington. So the diversity is quite remarkable. Um, they do have some birds that we have here in the North America. Um, this is a burrowing owl, not normally seen in trees here, um, but in Peru, they sometimes go up in trees, I guess. Um, they're pretty cool. You, you probably know something, or a thing or two about burrowing owls. They largely live in burrows in the ground. Um, in Peru, they largely actually live in hollowed out trees, um, like big burned logs, especially where um, there's been a lot of slash and burn agriculture. So there are, I think, four pairs on this property because there's a lot of agriculture kind of around the area. Um, another cool bird uh, in South America is, uh, there are a lot of cool night jars. This is an oscillated poor will. Um, they basically camouflage themselves on the forest floor. This bird, I took this with my macro lens. So I was about, you know, the bird was about as far away from me as my computer is right now. I probably, I could have grabbed this bird had I wanted to. Um, I didn't because I was respectful. Um, but eventually I did get a little too close for comfort, I guess. And it flushed and underneath it was this cute, I think it's cute, I guess, subjective. Um, looked slightly dazed. Um, but uh yeah, their their camouflage is really incredible. I mean, had I not seen the eye shine of this bird, I would have I would have never seen it. 
um, even though it's right next to the trail. Like this nest was right next to the trail and nobody, is, nobody had seen it before I did, so. Um, this is called a barred fruit eater. Um, they're barred, they eat fruit. They live <laughs> in the Andes. Um, they're beautiful birds. Um, all fruit eaters are quite ornate and spectacular. This is a, you know, just one of my favorite birds that I've seen in Peru. They're just quite beautiful. I don't really know any fun facts about them. They're, they're just cool. <laughs> um, this, similar to the barred fruit eater, don't really know any super fun facts about this bird. This is called an elegant crescent chest, and I think it's adequately named. Um, they're quite beautiful, small, little skulky, kind of wren-like birds. Uh, this was in northwestern Peru. Um, actually, I was visiting a friend in northwestern Peru, which is very similar. I would never have thought this, but northwestern Peru is actually very similar to Arizona or New Mexico, like the American Southwest. Um, it's very arid. There's a lot of canyons, and uh, it's just really fascinating. I, I was shocked. Like, I was like, I, if you dropped me here and covered my ears and didn't let me see any birds, like, I would not be able to tell you that I was not in Arizona right now. Pretty, pretty neat. Um, back to the Amazon. Um, this is a mannequin. This is a white bearded mannequin. Uh, mannequins are a large, diverse group of birds that, um, similar to the Indian cock of we were talking about earlier, um, they um, have these lecks. And so the, all the males will just kind of dance around. Each species has a different dance. This particular species is called white bearded mannequin because they puff out these throat feathers and uh, like do this weird wing clap. And I, I, I won't try and imitate it because I will never do as good of a job as actual birds. But um, all of these dances, if you're interested in this, um, look up some YouTube videos of this. Um, I've never, they're really hard to record, but like, the video of because they're typically hiding but other they've been very well studied and um each species has like their own unique dance they're kind of like the birds of paradise of uh papua new guinea but uh in the amazon um this is another species of mannequin this is called blue capped mannequin this i found this on a night hike um it was sleeping so i was able to get up really close to it uh and uh, get a nice picture of it as they do a different dance um, where they kind of flash their bright neon blue crown in the forest understory. And it just looks like they're glowing as they're dancing around in the understory. It's really cool. Um, this was a bit sad. Um, while I was there, I found this, uh, this is called a barred forest falcon, which is actually a very difficult bird to see. Um, but it had, I'm not sure what happened to it. It might have um, eaten some like poisoned rodent or something. It was never, it was not doing very well when you eventually had to euthanize it. But I will say it was very cool to hold this bird in my hand. Um, like I said, this bird, I, I'd never actually seen this bird before. Um, I'd only heard them. I hear them every day, but I'd never seen one. So it was a mixed blessing, but um, it's a reminder to not use rodent poison, uh, use mouse traps instead, I guess. Um, moving on to mammals, there are many cool mammals in South America. This is a, it's called a titi monkey. Um, they do make this ridiculous loud howling noise. Uh, it's just, I, I couldn't, again, I can't describe it. I wish I had a recording for you, but it's like one of the most absurd noises um, that they, they start um, calling right at sunrise. So this was my alarm every morning was these guys. Um, there are also capuchin monkeys in um, Peru. This is probably the most common species of monkey. These, here it is eating some fruit. They are important um, seed dispersers. So they will eat many different species of plants uh, or, or fruit and uh, disperse the seeds throughout the forest. Um, all monkeys are important seed dispersers. This is um, called a, excuse me, a saddleback tamarind. They're quite cute. Um, they have like these little um, kind of like down pointed ears, which I am a big fan of. Um, and they hop around uh, between the trees, um, kind of like squirrels. Um, they're not actually that much larger than squirrels, but they're much cuter in my opinion. <laughs> Um, this is, uh, called a mouse possum. This is, these are, um, pretty easy to see on a night hike in South America. Um, then when you shine a light on them, they just freeze. And so I was able to take this with my, my macro, um, camera. Uh, they're 
quite literally the size of a mouse, um, even though they're technically a marsupial. Um, another kind of possum that is uh, in uh, Peru is one that you might recognize. This is actually the same species of possum that we have here, but this is found in the Peruvian Amazon, uh, several thousand miles away. This is a Virginia possum that I happened to cross one day in the forest. Um, some of my favorite parts of the Amazon are the reptiles and amphibians. This is a black caiman here uh, on a lake. Um, they're, they can grow to be four or five meters long and are quite impressive animals, certainly. Um, walking around, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of photos. So I'm gonna kind of start going through them a bit faster here so we can get through everything. But uh, another one of the things that I love about um, the Amazon is night hikes. I think that's actually maybe my favorite part of um, South and Central America is going on night hikes because you're able to find lots of really cool critters that you would never see out in the day. This is called a tree runner um, and uh, they spend their day all the way up in the top of the canopy. Um, but at night you can find them sleeping down closer to the ground. Um, this is uh, anaconda. Um, it was too large for me to get a adequately descriptive photo of the size. Um, this particular individual is probably about 15 feet long, maybe a bit longer. Um, we saw it sunning out on a uh, log along the side of a river. So this was my first and only anaconda. I was very excited. <laughs> um, this is a smaller species of boa called the Amazon tree boa. Um, they come in many different sizes and shapes and colors, um, but they're actually quite aggressive. This one bit me a couple times, um, but I still love them. Um, and I still had to pick it up, of course. Um, this is another kind of snake. This is called a parrot snake eating a frog. Um, I felt a bit bad for the frog. It was still kicking around while it was going into the snake's mouth, but the snake looked quite content and I felt happy for the snake. I love snakes, so I I was I was cheering him on. Um, this is another kind of snake. This is called the Amazon banded snake. Um, their eyes, like I don't I don't know if you can see it super well in the picture, but their eyes are just like insane. It's like a little galaxy um, kind of in their eye. Um, they're very beautiful. Um, I I took a lot of time to take pictures of this guy. Um, this is, I actually, I think this is like its own thing. It's not a snake. It's not a lizard. I think they're called worm lizards, but they're their own thing. Um, these do not have eyes. You can see this little dot here is where the eye used to be. And this uh, kind of animal is completely subterranean. They spend almost their entire life underground. We were incredibly lucky to see this uh, animal at all. Um, they just like wiggle around. They basically just like inch themselves forward. I, it's like the most, like normally if you're a snake, you're going like this, right? But they just like go straight forward and just kind of like inch themselves like an inchworm. It's really cool to watch. Um, they're very dorky looking, but um, uh, I, I thought it was really cool. And we were very lucky to see this. Um, this is called a uh, climbing uh, salamander. This is the, you know, the salamanders in North America largely live under logs and streams, uh, places where it's really wet, but it's so wet in South America that the salamanders climb up trees. So they have like little suction cup feet that allow them to climb up trees. And these uh, little nose things, um, there's, a, there's a science word for that, but I don't remember what it is. Um, <laughs> They, they uh, are incredibly sensitive and they uh, use these little sniffers to find little bugs that they eat way up in the tree. Um, here's another angle. I, I just love this picture. They're cool. Um, this is like one of the coolest frogs that I have seen in South America. This is called the tiger monkey frog. Um, you can kind of see why it's called that if you look at the inner thigh. Um, this genus um, is called Phylomedusa. Uh, all of the frogs in this genus are just like spectacular. Um, this is one of the best of them. They're just really cool looking. 
they live almost their entire lives high, high up in the canopy. And it's very rare to see them at all. So this was lucky to uh, see. Um, this is another ridiculous looking frog. Um, this is called the Suriname horn frog. Um, they just, they will literally sit in the same place for two weeks um, and won't move. They just sit there and wait for prey to walk by in front of them. Um, you know, it's kind of like Jabba the Hutt. Um, and they have like these huge teeth in their mouth, actually. They, they can, the big ones, they can get um, the size of like a pretty large toad that you'd see here. And they will eat mice and, you know, small rodents. It's very impressive. <laughs> They're incredibly cool looking. They come in a wide range of colors, but they mostly look like dead leaves. Um, this is a poison dart frog. This is called three stripe poison dart frog. They're very hard to see, but if you learn their call, they're actually one of the most common frogs in um, Peru. They're calling all over the place. And it took me like, weeks to, to find one even though i knew what they sounded like they're really cool looking um this is another cool frog uh, this is called map tree frog they're just pretty they live in the trees they look like a tree frog um here's another picture of that one this guy was on a flower um uh very pretty this though is the coolest frog in the whole world as far as i'm concerned uh, I have looked at a lot of frogs in my life um, in many different places, and this is the best one. Um, let me let me tell you, this is it's called I think it's called the fringe leaf frog, um, or uh, uh, Cruzio hylocraspidopus is the scientific name. They are just absolutely like splendid. They have like these ridiculous little fringes on their legs. They got these cool stripes. They're similar to the phylomedusa frog that I was talking about, where they spend most of their life really high in these uh, trees in the canopy. They live largely in what are called bromeliads, which are kind of like uh, what you would think of as an uh, as an air plant, and they live in like little um, water pockets up high in those air plants. But they come down just to breed, um, and we were incredibly lucky to see this one. I was like absolutely losing it. This was the animal I wanted to see the most when I was in Peru. I finally saw it. Uh, third, third visit to the charm. Very happy. Um, now moving on to creepy crawlies, and uh, some of you may like this less than the birds and things, but there are many really cool. Uh, insects and arachnids in um, Peru. This is a spider that had just molted uh, and was hanging out of its molted um, skin. Um, oops. This is a kind of crab spider. I just think he's cool. I don't really know anything about spiders. I just think they're pretty. Um, they like to eat insects and that makes them my friend. Um, this is another spider. Uh, this is kind of a uh, huntsman spider. Uh, this species is actually very common in Peru. You see it a lot, but they're bright red. Like most of the insects, if you saw them in North America, you'd be like, whoa, that is the coolest insect I've ever seen. But in the Amazon, it's just like you turn around another leaf and you're like, oh, there's a cooler one. Um, this is a really cool spider. This uh, is called the Brazilian wandering spider. Perhaps you've heard of them. This is the most, arguably the most venomous spider in the world. Um, they... Uh, I think have been recorded to kill like small kids and old people. I think I, um, if you were to get bit, you'd probably be fine. Well, it would hurt a lot. Um, the The fun fact that I know about this spider um, is that this this spider, if it bites a man, it causes what's called priapism, um, which is basically it's a it's a fancy science word for a very uh, long lasting painful erection. So they actually um, use components of this spider's venom to create drugs like Viagra. So if you ever use Viagra, you can say, thank you, Brazilian wandering spider. Um, just in case. Um, now you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I. This is uh, a bit less, oh, man, this video might not work, but um, I do have a picture of this too. This was so cool. I have always wanted to see this in person. Um, I had heard about this since I was a little kid. 
what's happening is this wasp here on the left, sorry, this video is, I don't know why, it's working fine on my computer, but um, this wasp is about four or five inches long. Um, it's called a tarantula hawk wasp. Maybe you've heard of them. What they do is they hunt for tarantulas. They crawl into all these little burrows and look for tarantulas. And when they find one, um, they sting it with it. They have a very powerful, painful sting. It's actually rated the second most painful sting of any insect after the bullet ant, which is also very common in Peru. Um, and they paralyze the spider. And so the spider, when it's paralyzed, the wasp drags it back to a hole where it deposits the spider, and which is paralyzed, but still very much alive, and deposits one egg on the spider. Um, the wasp then leaves, covers up the hole, and the egg hatches, buries into the tarantula, and slowly eats it alive for a couple of weeks. Um, so this this lost larva basically slowly grows and eats more and more of this tarantula and right as the wasp is about ready to hatch into an adult wasp that kills its host and goes off into the world to cause this miserable existence to some other tarantula um this you know it sounds very horrific and it's very visible in this um instance but this is this uh I guess life strategy is called um, parasitoidism. Um, does anybody know, has anybody heard of parasitoidism? Um, do you know what the difference between being a parasitoid and a parasite is? Anybody? Um, yeah, you, so a parasite keeps the victim alive. If you're malaria, you're a parasite. You're, ideally, you're not killing your host. Um, but a parasitoid, the end stage is killing its host. So parasitoids are actually remarkably common in this world. There um, are some scientists that believe that every insect has a species specific parasitoid. So if you were to think about that and say there are, I don't know, X million number of species of insects, we don't really know how many there are, there's so many. Um, and each single insect has some wasp that does this to them in some, you know, progressively more and more cruel way. It's really, it's, uh, it opens your eyes to a whole hidden underworld of, uh, you know, misery for insects. So let's all just take a minute to be grateful that there's not some giant wasp out there that's going to hunt us down and lay its babies on us. Um, this, um, moving on to a more cheerful topic. This is, um, this is a harlequin beetle. This is another insect that I had always wanted to see. Um, you've maybe seen these in like a museum case or something. This is one of the most exotic bugs in the world. Um, they are absolutely huge. I have a size comparison here. So you can see these legs are about a foot across. Uh, this is a, a professor that I have worked with in the past, the director of the nonprofit that I work with. Um, photographing this insect and he is an entomologist and he was so so psyched to see this beetle I've never seen him happier than when he was photographing this beetle um, it was really cool um, there are many other cool insects in Peru um, this is a cool one this is called a leaf-footed bug because their feet look like little leaves I don't really know why but they're cool um, this is called a Colloquially, it's called a waxy butt lantern bug. I don't know what the scientific name is. They have this waxy looking substance coming out of its butt. I don't really know what it does, but it's weird. Um, this is an army ant. Perhaps you've heard of army ants. They are the most successful predator on planet Earth. Um, that is because they, they hunt in these huge swarms that can uh, span for a kilometer or more in the forest and they basically eat anything in their path. Um, I've seen them eat frogs. I've seen them eat lizards. I've seen them eat small rodents. Um, it's actually pretty sad to watch like a frog get eaten by an army ant because it just gets completely covered in ants and they slowly eat it a lot. Um, they're really amazing though. Um, they, they make um, what's called a bivouac which is basically a big ball of living ants that they surround their queen in, and then they transport their queen 
along with them um, as they move through the forest. Um, the workers will like carry it along. Um, they're, they're really interesting. Um, this is a cockroach. Not all cockroaches are ugly, just the ones in North America, which are invasive and from Australia and Europe are. Um, but the Amazonian cockroaches are quite nice. Um, this is a leaf shield mantis. Um, pretty neat, they look like a leaf. They're, they do a very convincing job looking like a leaf. Um, this, uh, you might look at this and think, oh, that's a wasp. But this is uh, an excellent example of mimicry. This is actually a moth. And so in the Amazon, many different insects and, well, really anything, will Im imitate something that looks more dangerous than they are. This moth is just a harmless moth, but it looks like a what's called a warrior wasp, which having been stung several times by warrior wasps, I can attest to the fact that they are very, they get a very painful sting. And so most uh, predators, when they see this, they're like, nope, I'm not touching that. I know what that will do to me. And so this little innocent wa uh, moth gets to go on uh, li living life protected by looking like something it's not. Um, I'm not going to go too far into the mimicry because there are many different examples of it. This is another uh, moth that looks somewhat like a wasp, but it is indeed a moth. Um, this is, I, I'm going to go through a lot of pictures of moths really quick because there are some really crazy moths in the Amazon. This, I saw this and I was like, what is that? And it took me a few minutes to figure out that it was a moth. It looks like a dead leaf and like also bird poop. It's bizarre. Um, this is a moth that kind of looks like a praying mantis and is bright orange. I'm not sure I'm colorblind, but I think it's orange. Um, this is another cool moth. I just thought it was cool. Another cool moth. I really like this one. I think it's green. It's nice. This one's really pretty. Lots of cool moths. This one's huge. This is like the size of my hand. Um, this is a big sphinx moth. Um, another cool moth. Another cool moth. Another cool moth. <laughs> you get the idea. There's a lot of really cool moths and there's a lot of really cool everything in the Amazon. The diversity there is absolutely astounding. Um, I mean, this is like 10 or 15 different moths of like thousands and thousands of species. Like just on this property, there's been something like 1,200 species of butterflies that have been identified in 50 hectares. Like the diversity there is truly staggering. Um, uh, and these moths and butterflies have really weird caterpillars. This is called um, a slug moth caterpillar because they kind of look similar to sea slugs. Here's a couple more examples of slug moths. They're really, really weird and really, really cool. And they're very painful if you touch them. They have, you see these spines here? Not fun to touch. Um, this is another weird caterpillar. Doesn't even look like a caterpillar or really an animal. It just looks like slime. Um, here's another cool slug moth caterpillar. Um, they really do look quite like nudibranchs, but they're terrestrial in the Amazon. Um, and eventually, a lot of these cool caterpillars, if they're lucky, hatch into pretty butterflies. Um, if they're not lucky, they hatch into very brown moths. Um, but there are many very beautiful butterflies as well. This butterfly is called Caria. Um, it's the genus. I don't know the specific species because there's like 20 species in this genus that all look the same. Um, this is like the coolest butterfly I think I've ever seen. Um, I, I'm blanking on the scientific name right now, but the tail is like the same length as the body on this guy. Really impressive. This is a kind of hair streak. Um, this is uh, in the genus Adelpha. This is another species of butterfly. They do a lot of research on butterflies where I've been working. Um, that guy who I showed you a picture of um, research, uh, taking pictures of the beetle is a uh, lepidopterist, so somebody who studies butterflies. So I looked at a lot of butterflies when I was there. This one's cool. This is called a morpho butterfly. Maybe you've heard of these. There are many different species of morphos. These are like the giant butterflies. If you've ever been to like Costa Rica or somewhere in South America, these are the huge giant blue butterflies that you see flying through the understory. It's really hard to get a picture of them um, when the blue is showing because they um, keep their wings closed, but they're quite impressive. Um, this is called um, Eulasia. This is another kind of, this is called a metal mark, quite beautiful. Um, this is another kind of metal mark, Delphina. 
Um, and uh, that's Peru. Um, we'll come back to Peru, but um, I want to go through kind of some fun animals in Kenya. Like I said, I was in Peru for three months. I was doing a lot of stuff um, kind of with conservation, and I'll come back and bring it back to the conservation, but I want to go through some cool things in Kenya first. This is a typical view uh, on a safari, um, elephants in a big savanna. This is in the Maasai Mara. Maybe you've heard of that place. It's the north end of the Serengeti um, ecosystem um, in Kenya. The Serengeti is in um, in uh, Tanzania. Um, while I was in while I was in Kenya, I was birding with my friend here. This guy's name is Adrian Hinkle. If you're a birder, you may have heard of him. He's from Portland. He would be a world-class birding guide if he chose to do so. Um, but luckily for me, he's just my friend and took me around in this car looking at birds um, for a month, which was awesome. Um, this is a peak that we hiked up, um, kind of a very unique high elevation uh, Kenyan uh, ecosystem. This is above 4,000 meters, so about the same elevation as uh, Mount Rainier. But instead of being under snow and glaciers, because it's at the equator, there are all these really cool, weird trees. Um, here's uh, what we did basically for the entire month I was there, driving around, taking pictures of birds in the savannah. Um, but right when I got there, we went to an uh, event that's called Ngulia, um, which is a bird banding event. So I got to Africa, I got on a train, uh, right from the airport, went on this train to this national park and immediately started catching amazing African birds and getting to hold them in my hand. This is perhaps my favorite. This is called a Somali bunting. They're just crazy beautiful. Like the, the breast is just a ridiculous color. Um, and so here's where we were doing that. This is, uh, if you've ever never caught birds before uh, for bird banding, um, this is called a mist net. So you set up these nets that these birds can't see, and they come flying up this ridge, um, especially if there's low fog or mist. Um, and basically, as they're coming up this ridge, migrating, um, they fly into our nets, and we walk around, and we take them out of our nets, and we put bands on them so we can tell if we catch a bird, for example, that was banded two years ago, we know that we banded it. Or, for example, there was another... There was a, a barn swallow that we caught while I was there that was banded in, I think, Kazakhstan. Um, so you kind of be, are able to build up a kind of like database of where these birds are going, where they're coming from. If somebody um, in Europe, for example, catches one of these birds um, in Europe, they're able to say, oh, this bird was caught and banded in Kenya, where it must spend the winter. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a scientific endeavor, um, and it's also just really cool to hold birds in your hand and get to see them up really close. Um, I had a great time taking photos um, with my macro uh, setup. This is called a variable sunbird. The colors on this bird, I wish I wasn't colorblind just for this bird. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous, even to me as a colorblind person. Um, this is called a white-throated robin. Um, very beautiful. Um, this is called a cutthroat, named for its red throat. Um, they were also very nice. This is a purple grenadier, just giving you an idea of some of the African birds that we were seeing. Um, and this is a common uh, phenomenon when you're banding birds, is to get bit by birds. Um, it's always worth it. Um, so uh, after this uh, bird banding event, um, we went touring around for a couple weeks, just driving around uh, in my friend's car. Um, driving in Kenya is incredibly dangerous and crazy, but um, it was definitely worth it. This is at a place called Lake Jipe. This is right on the border with Tanzania. Um, and uh, this just kind of gives you an idea of what it's like to go bird watching or going on safari in Kenya. I mean, we're looking at all these amazing um, shorebirds. These are skimmers and a few different species of terns, a few different species of plover, many shorebirds. And there's hippos in the background, almost too many hippos. We're <laughs> camping right next to this lake and camping when there's this many hippos was pretty sketchy, let me tell you. Um, and then there's some giraffes in the background and then there's elephants and uh, and Paula's and gazelles and all kinds of stuff. It was just amazing. 
um, the number of animals that we were seeing there. Here's a panoramic view at the same lake. It was just absolutely spectacular, the birding there. And there are a lot of birds there. Um, these are barn swallows. Um, this video is not really going to work. Um, well, you can kind of get an idea. Each one of these dots is a barn swallow. Um, we estimated that in this swarm of barn swallows, there's probably between four or 500,000 barn swallows. There may have been way more. There were so many that we could not count them. Um, one of my friends that I was birding with um, says ironically in this video, I think he says it ironically, but he's very much probably right. He says, this is probably like the entire breeding barn swallow population of Ontario. And it's probably more. Like it is, he's, he's Canadian and he's from Ontario. So that's why he said that. But this was just like an absolutely ridiculous spectacle. Um, and spectacles like this are not that uncommon in Africa just because of how many things migrate there for the winter. December is an excellent time to go to Africa if you ever uh, have the desire to visit. Um, some of my favorite birds in Kenya and Africa are called coursers. They're kind of like a plover, um, but they're way cooler and skinnier in my opinion. I, I, we don't have coursers here, so I was very excited about them. There are five species in Kenya. We saw all five of them. This is called two-banded courser. This, um, my friends were absolutely like losing it over this bird. It might look just kind of brown to you. This is called violet tipped courser. Um, this is a bird that's not even seen annually in Kenya, um, but we were able to see it on a night drive, driving around looking for birds. It was just sitting in the middle of the road. Um, it was awesome. Um, this is called Hemmings courser, um, another really pretty bird. All of these are shorebirds. And this is a uh, three-banded courser. Um, all of these are shorebirds, but most shorebirds you think of, oh, it's at a beach or it's at some muddy lake. Coursers just walk around in the desert um, and they eat insects off the ground. They just kind of run around in bare areas. Um, but when I was there, Kenya was getting a lot of rain. Um, and so normally they're way off in the fields and they're really hard to find and really hard to see because they're you know hiding in the grass. But the grass is actually so high that it was driving them out to the road. So we saw a lot of them. Um, I think on this day that I took this picture, we saw like 30 or something of this three-banded courser. My friend Adrian um, caught one of these at night. He just like shined his flashlight up at it and walked right up to it and grabbed it. Um, it was really amazing. <laughs> um, this was one of my other favorite birds. You've probably seen them at a zoo or on a nature documentary, this is called a gray crown crane. I don't actually know why they're called a gray crown crane because their crown is not gray. gray. Their crown is either yellow or black, but either way, they're spectacular. And uh, I won't think too much about it, I guess. Um, they are a common sight on uh, African safaris and they're just absolutely stunning. They, they are monogamous and they're almost always seen in pairs um you see them walking around picking for insects in the grass um one of the other really cool bird families in africa is the turacos um this is called great blue turaco with like this crazy hairdo uh that's got going on there each turaco is has like some crazy hairdo um and has some other ridiculous um patterning um i think they're closely related to uh um, what are they called? Uh, oh, I, I guess we don't have, they're closely related to go away birds, but you may not know what a go away bird is. Um, they're basically like a giant tree turkey that runs around and eats things in the trees. They're awesome. This was my favorite, um, bird. I think that I saw in Kenya, this is called white crested Turaco. Um, I don't really know any fun facts about that. I don't really know that many fun facts about the birds and stuff in Kenya because I've spent much less time there. All I know is they're really freaking cool looking. Um, I love them. Um, this is a, a hornbill, um, the South American equivalent of a toucan. Um, they're named such because they have a nice horn on their bill. Um, 
they uh this one is visiting a nest site so we watched it um putting clay into its nest and kind of lining the nest um for its little babies they're quite large um this bird is about the size of a canada goose maybe a bit larger even they're quite quite big very cool um this is a secretary bird you may be also seen um pictures of this before another classic bird of the african savanna they are about this tall and they walk around on these really long stilted legs looking for little lizards and rodents and things in the grass. They're really amazing. I, I know I'm just saying they're really amazing for every single one of these things, but it's because they are. Um, this is a African Scots owl. Um, this, uh, similar to that night jar that I was talking about earlier, I could have easily grabbed this owl had I wanted to. I decided to respect its privacy. Um, but uh, these little owls are basically the African equivalent to our screech owls. They're a little bit smaller, but um, they fill the same niche, and uh, they are small nocturnal owls, which largely hunt um, rodents. Pretty cool. So um, the, the starlings that we are accustomed to here in North America that are, we aren't supposed to have, the European starling, um is a really a bad representation of how awesome starlings are um this is called a golden breasted starling this was one of the very first birds i saw in africa um it was uh visiting its nest um right where i took this picture um most starlings in africa are just absolutely beautiful they're brightly colored they often have long tails they sound kind of gross still, just like the European starlings. But, you know, they're, we're, we're giving starlings here a lot of hate compared to what, what they deserve, at least the African ones. Um, this is another species of starling. This is called lesser blue-eared starling. I just like the composition of this picture because it shows off. Um, this looks very much like a cactus, you might think, um, but there actually are no cacti. In Africa, this is what's called a euphorbia. We have euphorbias here in North America as well, but in uh, in Africa and other parts of the globe, they have evolved to basically fill fill that niche that cacti have, um, and so they they show a very similar form. They have spines. They're very similar in all in all uh, manner of appearance. They're just taxonomically different. Um, this is a uh, some people think these are beautiful. Some people think they're ugly. I think they're kind of endearing. Um, this is called a vulturing guinea fowl. Really cool, um, charismatic, and typical bird of the African savanna. Um, really weird looking, but I love them. Their feathers are so ornate, and then their head is just so disturbingly featherless. <laughs> and they have like this like mutton chop thing over here, like. I don't really know what's going on there, but I, I like them. <laughs> um, another uh, group of larger ground dwelling birds in Africa are what's called the bustards. Um, this is a black bellied bustard. Um, there are many different sizes and shapes of bustard. Perhaps the most impressive is this bird. This is called the quarry bustard. The first time I saw one of these was on a night drive and I thought it was an ostrich. I was like, what is that thing? That is like absolutely giant. They're at least about as tall as I am. Um, they are the largest flying or the heaviest flying bird. These birds can weigh about 50 pounds and still can fly. Um, having seen them in person, I never saw one fly. I am shocked that they can fly because they're, like I said, I literally thought it was an ostrich the first time I saw one. They're absolutely bonkers. Like, I, I really don't think this, this photo does justice to like how large they are. They're just truly massive and they can puff up these huge feathers um, on the neck, kind of like a lion's mane, uh, which makes them even more impressive. Um, and then there's another species of buster. This is a buff crested buster, which is very small. So they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, one of my like best bird watching experiences of all time was um, in Kenya. This was a shorebird uh, roost at high tide on the coast. Um, this is just like a snapshot of all the birds that were, were there. There were probably like 5,000 or more shorebirds here. And all of them are like, in North America, I don't know how serious of birders a lot of you are, but 
Um, some of these birds, if you like look here closely, um, these are Turek sandpipers, lesser sand plover. Um, there's a black belly plover back here, which is a bird that we have in North America. If you are a North American birder, you dream of finding a lesser sand plover on the beach in California or Washington or wherever. But I was just like looking at like thousands of them. And I was just like absolutely losing my mind as this was happening. My favorite shorebird um, that was in this group are these guys. They're called crab plovers. Um, crabs are very numerous in Kenya on the beach. Like there are just like hundreds and hundreds of crabs. And these guys specialize in walking around and just eating crabs with their giant bills. They're amazing. They sound really weird. Um, they're just so cool. Um, so one of, uh, one of the coolest experiences that I had in Kenya, Kenya was an amazing experience for birds in general. We saw, I think, 715 species of birds in a month, um, which is pretty remarkable considering that's how many species I've seen in the U.S. like in my entire life. Um, but my, one of my favorite experiences was we did a big day when we were in Kenya, but we had a car because my friend had a car. And um, so my friend has been living there for over two years. He knows Kenya very well. He's like completely obsessed with birds, just like I am. And so um, he put together this route that sent us all, I'll come to a map picture eventually that um, actually, why don't I'll, I'll go to the map. Um, so you can kind of see, um, we started up here at what's called Lake Naivasha drove down this road to Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya, went, went for like a big lap of Nairobi National Park, which is the best um, birding area in the country of Kenya, and then went way out here for the end of the day. Whoops. Um, forgot that was a touch screen. Um, and so that was a bit of a spoiler. We saw some really cool birds on this day. We started at this big marsh with yellow-billed storks, and Goliath Heron. Goliath Heron is another very apt name. They're also about as tall as I am. They're like considerably larger than our great blue herons. You can't really tell from this picture, but they're massive. Um, we drove around through Nairobi National Park, like I said. Um, we saw these really cool um, vultures. This is called Rupel's griffin um, and tawny eagles. They were eating some dead something um, and we're very happy about it in the national park. Um, we also saw this African fish eagle, um, and if you look closely, there's a spotted flycatcher there, right in front of it. Um, I put this on eBird as a uh, as a photo of a spotted flycatcher, and they asked me to take it down. I don't know why. Um, uh, anyways, we saw a lot of really cool birds. Um, we drove a long ways, and we ended at this lake. Um, at night where we were using a spotlight to shine out uh, on the lake to see flamingos and this bird, which is called chestnut banded plover. This was a life bird for me. Um, this was our last bird of the day on this big day effort. Um, we, our goal for this day was to see 300 species of birds uh, in one day, which I had never done before. 300 species is like a good year for Washington. Um, normally and um we were kind of like debating oh did we see 300 species did we not like i don't really think we did throughout the day um but we ended up actually seeing 318 species of bird the um this was kind of a trial run of this route actually my friend wants to go back and kind of like do this again with some other people who know kenya better than i do um and uh, the driving record for kenya is I think 320 species. So we almost broke the driving record for the country. Um, for, um, for kind of perspective, the North American record um, is 292 species from Texas, um, which is very impressive for North America. Um, but in um, South America, you can do on foot big days. Uh, if you're really, really good at the calls and um, know the area, you can do an on foot big day and see over 350 species of birds just walking in one day. Um, so the tropics are really spectacular for diversity. Kenya is excellent, but South America is even crazier. The, the world's big day record is from Ecuador. I believe it was 445 species, but they cheated the use of plane. Um, 
there's there's always a little asterisk if you use a plane in a big day. I won't get too too pedantic, but uh, and this is what it feels like at the end of 24 hours of burning as hard as you can. Um, yeah, I was very tired afterwards, um, but it was totally worth it. Um, uh, now I'll go into kind of some Kenyan mammals. Uh, we're doing our time, we're doing all right. And then uh, I'll kind of um, go through these relatively quickly. This is a lilac breasted roller in front of a heart piece. They're called heart piece because they're kind of like hearts. They're very common um, big mammal in Kenya. Um, here's a spotted hyena checking us out. Um, he's probably a little bit interested in the tasty morsels you hear in this con. Um, here's a nice young female lion. Um, uh, the lions are celebrities in Kenya. If you go to the national parks for safari, um, you'll often see like a group of like 10, 15, even as many as like 50 cars just gathered around lions. Um, I always feel a bit sorry for them, but only that like kind of wears out off once you like see the lion and you're like, wow, that's really cool. That's a lion. Um, they are very large. They are larger than I thought. I've seen, I've been lucky. I've seen eight mountain lions in my life and they're considerably larger than a mountain lion. Uh, I mean, you've probably seen them in a zoo, so you kind of know what to expect, I guess. This was, um, I took this picture after um, witnessing one of the cooler uh, events that we experienced on this uh, trip. We watched these, uh, this family of lions. There are a couple females and some cubs. Um, and these lions, uh, there's this flooded river running through Nairobi National Park. There had been a lot of rain, so there's a lot of water in this river. And these lions herded a group of about 150 zebras into this river, this like raging river. Um, they were not actually successful in catching a zebra. But we actually watched, I think, two zebras drowned trying to walk across this river, which was really impressive. I actually felt pretty sad for the lions, too, because they went to all this work to try and get these zebras to, you know, cross this river. And then they didn't get to eat the zebras that drowned because they were stuck in the river. Um, so nobody won that one, but it was really crazy to watch. Um, and these lions are just kind of sad. You can see maybe um, the rain. That's, oh, no, you can't hit the screen. Um, well, there's rain um, raining sideways, and they did not seem to enjoy that. Much like other cats, they did not like getting wet. Here's some zebras hugging. They're pretty cute. Um, here's a nice elephant. Um, this was in the Maasai Mara. Um, this, uh, was, this is the same female elephant with a little baby. Elephants are like apparently really common in Kenya, but I was there when um, it was very wet. And so all of the game had kind of dispersed because normally if you're there in the dry season, all of the game will kind of congregate at these wetter areas with more grass. Um, but I did not have that luck. Um, here's another big male elephant. This guy walked like right towards their car, which is pretty cool. This is a, this was one of my favorite animals that we saw. This is called a bat-eared fox. Um, they're kind of like the kit foxes we have in the southwestern U.S. where they have like these huge ears, really goofy looking, um, really cool, really cute. And giraffes. I really liked giraffes. I can relate to giraffes being 6'4 uh, and relatively gawky. Um, so, you know, I, I really felt for the just awkwardness of giraffes. Um, it really reminded me of a teenage me. Um, here's one uh, sticking out his tongue as he's walking towards us. Um, they're just always, they always look goofy. Like, I, I don't ever think I saw a giraffe and I was like, yeah, it just looks like a normal giraffe. They always look a little bit weird. Um, okay, so that is kind of the end of the happy animal fun time. Um, now we're gonna talk about conservation. Um, so I hope to start a PhD this fall. Uh, I just interviewed at uh, UC Berkeley, hopefully you can want me to go there. Um, but uh, I hope to study conservation, especially in the world's tropics. And that is because it is incredibly important. Um, the world's tropics harbor most of the world's biodiversity. Uh, in Peru, for example, just in Peru, there's almost 2000 species of birds. 
that are found in Peru. Like in the Amazon region as a whole, there's something like 3,800 species of birds, which is there's almost 10,000, there's a little over 10,000 species in the world. So it's like over a third of the world's birds live in the tropics of South America. Uh, and that's just South America. I mean, then you have the tropics of Asia and the tropics of Africa. They're all incredibly species rich, but they're also under incredibly high threat. I took this photo on our big day. Um, when we were scouting for the big day, we went to the field. It's amazing, like nice marshy habitat. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there's like 10 species of like pretty rare bird, including one Kenyan endemic that is um, critically endangered that can be found in this field. And when we came back on the big day, I don't know if you can really tell, but there's a guy tilling this field with a tractor, um, which was really sad to see. So habitat degradation threatens these really cool birds that can be found in these areas, as well as many other things. This is a long-tailed widow bird that was in that field. Um, that I took this picture right where this guy was tilling the field. Um, this male widow bird probably has no home anymore. And this is happening all around the world all the time. I don't really know as much about the conservation issues in Kenya, so I won't speak to those quite as much. However, this is um, this is a motorcycle uh, in Kenya loaded down with charcoal. Um, I, it is amazing that this motorcycle could drive because each one of these bags is probably over 50 pounds. Um, and, uh, but it was gone when we got back, so clearly it could drive. Um, they charcoal is a big illegal industry in Kenya. Um, they basically cut down trees um, in kind of less populated areas, um, burn all of these trees in a big pit. Um, here's my friend Tim for size comparison. And then they basically uh, package up the embers for use for cooking. Uh, and this is a huge illegal industry in Kenya. I, I don't think it's legal anywhere in Kenya to um, make charcoal um, with wild trees, but it happens all the time. Uh, and especially in this area, we saw a lot of it just walking around and uh, driving around. But there's very little enforcement. And that is a common theme in the world's tropics. Um, you know, we are from the US where we have amazing national parks. We have, you know, park rangers that enforce the law. Uh, you know, if somebody cuts down like a, a redwood tree in California, probably they're going to get caught, or at least there's a pretty good chance that they're going to get caught, right? Because it's a redwood tree. It's huge. It's a problem. However, if you're in um, rural Peru or Kenya, the enforcement of their environmental laws is absolutely non-existent. Um, not to say that, um, you know, these problems are all a problem because of the people that are doing these, um, uh, you know, making these, uh, sorry, deforesting these areas and degrading the habitat. Um, it's often driven by outsider demand, often from North America, Europe, and the developed world. Um, I came across this tree that had been cut down and in just like some rain, I was walking off trail in the rainforest in Peru and somebody had cut down this tree and cut it into boards illegally. Um, and we're busy, you know, shipping it off. Uh, and I remember the guy who I was walking with um, saying, this is coming to a Home Depot near you. And he's not wrong. Um, about, third, for example, uh, Ikea, they source 30% of their timber from tropical Africa. Um, and that's just tropical Africa. And almost guaranteed all of that is probably illegally logged. Um, most of this uh, timber that's logged in Peru uh, is illegal. There are legal logging concessions where the government will give people like a section of land where they say, okay, you can log this, but you have to do it in this way. Nobody ever listens to the rules because there's no enforcement. But um, largely people, the government doesn't really ask questions because as long as they are, these people are making money, as long as they're selling the timber, as long as they're bringing in revenue for the country of Peru, then, or whichever country, insert country, tropical country here, it's not really questioned. Um, here are some other scenes um, in Peru. These are more boards that were cut down 
I mean, you can see kind of how wide these boards are. This must have been a huge tree. Um, and uh, certain species of trees like mahogany or ironwood in Peru are essentially extinct outside of very large, vast national parks where it's just inaccessible and un it's impossible for loggers to get back in there. Um, you can see here up on the top of the bank, there's no more trees. They logged all the trees up there, transported them down to the river. Now they'll um, transport those boards out to be sold, likely to um, first world markets. Um, and it's really very challenging to track where any of this timber, or we'll talk about um, gold mining and a couple other things in a minute. Um, it's really hard to track where these things are going. Like it's really hard for you to go to a store and say, like pick up a piece of plywood and say, it doesn't say this plywood was made in, you know, I don't know, Lexington, Kentucky. Um, they don't, they don't do that. It's really easy to just like, if you're a, a importer of wood to just get a huge shipment of wood and it all gets mixed together and it all gets cut into boards and then it goes out to a store and nobody really asks where it comes from. Um, so that's where we need to start asking, where is this coming from? Um, because a lot of the time it's coming from tropical countries uh, who are selling their products to um, the developed world. This is kind of a series of, you know, just how deforestation happens. Um, this, when I was here in 2022, this was a thriving forest. Uh, it was a palm swamp. Um, I mean, you can see how large this tree is. This is my, my friend Jose um, walking on this tree. Largely what they do is they'll either, sometimes they will set a fire um, initially. Oftentimes they'll cut down a bunch of trees and then set a fire. Um, you may have heard about like the big Am Amazonian wildfires. Um, in the dry season, um, these fires can get really out of hands and spread very quickly because it gets very dry. This year was a very long, very dry, dry season um, in, in part due to the strong El Nino that we are experiencing uh, now with our very mild winter in Washington. Um, but these fires, you know, fires, we're, we're very familiar with the effects of fires here in Washington, right? Like they can spread through huge amounts of forests and burn a lot of area. Um, there are studies that have shown if, even if it's a fire that just goes through the understory of a forest, it will often kill us up to about 50% of the trees in the forest just because the trees in tropical forests are, have very thin bark. And not unlike our ponderosa pines, um, they are not adapted to need fire. They don't, they're not used to fire. Historically in the Amazon, maybe an area would burn every 500 years, but now they're burning much more frequently because of agriculture, because of people starting fires to clear forests, and because of climate change making just the general environment drier and hotter. Um, so first they cut down the trees, they set a fire, uh, and this is what it looks like. Then they just clear away the trees and uh, they make, this is going to be fish ponds. Um, and again, like I said, um, last year it was forest like this um, all around. This is happening every second. It's something like 50 football fields, or no, sorry, five football fields are cleared in um, the Amazon rainforest every second. Uh, each year, it's millions of acres. Um, so it's a big problem and it's happening very quickly. This too last year was a track of forest, um, or 2022 was a track of forest. Now it is a food field. Um, so, you know, people obviously have to eat and obviously need to find a way to make their livelihoods. But uh, there are ways for us to, uh, you know, do agriculture in a more sustainable way. I'll get into that in a, in a bit, but you can kind of see now what deforestation looks like. Uh, eventually, this is a cow pasture, a lot of land, especially along roads in the Amazon look like this now, instead of the, you know, beautiful, amazing Amazonian rainforest, which is the most biodiverse ecosystem on planet Earth. Um, another huge problem that I'll talk about um, before I talk about kind of like solutions um, is illegal gold mining. Illegal gold mining is 
a huge problem in South America, especially in Peru. Um, you, off, you often see shops like this on Riverside towns. Um, and basically the government is encouraging people to illegally mine gold in Peru. Um, basically what they do is, um, this is called artisanal gold mining because it's happening at a small scale and it's not done with like heavy or, you know, high tech machinery. Um, basically what people do is they go to the rivers and they pump up the sediment up into a slurry through this pipe and over this board with some mats. Um, as they pump this slurry over the mats, the gold is dense, and so it sinks down into the mats and gets caught in fibers of the mat. Um, so after they've sent a bunch of sediment through this mat, then they take these mats and they dump all of the sediment into a, basically a big barrel. They literally dump liquid mercury into this barrel, obviously not very healthy to be exposing yourself to liquid mercury. And... Um, the gold miners will get into the barrel with the liquid mercury and just basically stomp around um, on the sediment and mix it around with their legs. Mercury and gold, when they mix, form what's called an amalgam, um, which is a basically it just bonds together so that you get the gold in a more visible form. You take these chunks of gold and mercury and the uh, miners, they basically just take these chunks and burn the mercury off in a frying pan, um, release methyl mercury into the atmosphere, the most dangerous and harmful form of mercury. So this is obviously terrible for the environment. It's, you know, it's releasing methyl mercury and liquid mercury. They basically just dump all the rest of the mercury just right back into the river. Um, so it's releasing that directly into the environment, which is affecting the wildlife. It's also affecting all of the people in that area, not least of which the miners. It's a very dangerous job um, if you're a miner and you're exposing yourself to these chemicals. It's also just dangerous work. Like you could get sucked into the river. You could get um, one of these big piles of rocks will fall on you, et cetera. It's very dangerous work. And these miners will work for often in 48-hour shifts. Um, so they are often very tired and injury is happening a lot. And this um, gold mining brings in a lot of kind of secondary crime. So the gold miners are not the most upstanding, the legal gold miners are not the most upstanding citizens necessarily in society. So crime rates increase in these areas that are um, have a lot of gold mining. My friend Jose, who I point out in the other picture, he actually got held at gunpoint. Um, in one of these gold mining areas while I was there this fall um, because they thought he was a Sicario. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but basically there's a lot of crime. And with that crime, these gold miners also um, drop, have a very high demand for prostitution. So um, you can kind of see, like there's a, this, this goes on for a, a long ways. I'll kind of show some more photos of the area. This is a... Uh, a gold mining area called La Pampa in Peru. This is a pic picture I took from the airplane. All of this is deforested Amazonian rainforest for um, gold mining. And so basically the forest is unable to come back into this land that's been mined because it's so heavily degraded and so you know filled with heavy metals that not anything is really able to live there. This is Boca, Colorado, which is um, one of the biggest gold mining towns in Peru. Statistically, probably one in three buildings in this picture is a prostitute bar, um, which is, you know, very sad and a uh, big societal issue. Um, these uh, miners will kind of lure young women from, especially up in the Andes, um, with the promise of, you know, good work and good money. And like babysitting is often like the kind of like front that they use to get people to move there. And then once they move there, they don't have enough money um, doing their like genuine job that they've been talked into. So they're often talked into um, prostitution as a means to, you know, make, a, make ends meet. Um, so I think in this town alone, uh, there's probably over a thousand um, prostitutes in, in uh, just this small town. 
um, it's it's a big problem societally um, with like the crime and everything that that brings to these communities. It's a big problem environmentally, and it's just you know dangerous for the health of these people. Like this area in Peru has the third highest mercury contamination in the world. The highest mercury contamination in the world is another illegal gold mining area in Colombia. So it's obviously terrible for a lot of these things. Um, this is a picture um, from a satellite um, of a gold mining area called White Patwa. This is a screenshot that I took in um, 2018, the last time I gave a talk about Peru. Um, this is um, a screenshot that I took this morning. Um, so you can see even just in the last, I guess it's been a little over five years, this has gotten much, much worse and it's constantly getting worse and worse. There's no real enforcement of this. The, because the miners are, you know, often heavily armed, uh, about every few years, the military will go in and uh, kind of try and displace the miners. It's more just like kind of a media stunt, though. They're never really effective. Like the, the army then leaves a few days later, and then everybody comes right back. Um, the government is often very much complicit with these uh, gold mining activities. Like the governor of Madre de Dios is um known to be a member of like this kind of illegal gold mining ring um and often passes legislation which is beneficial to these illegal gold miners um the peruvian government kind of just looks the other way because it is so uh beneficial to peru's economy um actually there's a great documentary on netflix about this if you're interested in learning about this anymore it's called rotten and or, or yeah, it's called Rotten, and the episode is called Dirty Gold, um, where they basically went and interviewed a CEO of an uh, American um, gold like smelting firm, or I don't know what you call them. Basically, somebody who um, acquires gold and sells it to like, the U.S. Mint and other places. Um, and 100% of the gold that this firm uh, is acquiring is fr from this area in Peru. Um, they send representatives down there to these gold mining areas to uh, find people who will sell them gold. They'll, these miners, you know, on a good day's work, you can make $150 um, illegally mining gold as a gold miner, um, which for Peru is a lot of money. Um, these people that are then selling or buying this gold um, in America, as it works its way kind of up that food chain, it becomes worth more and more and more until the people that are working in these um, in these kind of brokers um, or on the stock market are making millions of dollars, uh, making you know a hundred times more money than the people who are risking their lives and embodying all of this harm in South America. This same uh, CEO in this documentary went through a list in this documentary of the other kind of groups that acquire gold in the US and he estimated roughly about 80% of the of the gold acquisition firms in uh, the US who are selling gold to like the US mints and you know apple or you know jewelry i don't know providers makers um, are using dirty gold acquired from Peru, Colombia, etc. So I guess a solution, there, there's no real solution um, immediately because it requires a lot of uh, institutional and uh, policy uh, in Peru to stop this in enforcement. Um, but all of this is driven by us and by you know Europe, all of these first world countries that are driving this demand for gold because everybody wants to have the next newest iPhone or wants to buy their partner a gold ring. We never think about where these things come from. Um, and so this is happening around the world over and over again with every other element. If you're, we talk about silver, we talk about copper, cobalt, sapphire, um, uranium, like all of these things um, are costing a lot of these populations who are largely responsible for mining them, um, you know, huge amounts of 
environmental damage, huge amounts of social and societal issues. Um, and they're largely embodied by the people of Peru or the people of Colombia or the people of Kenya. Whereas we are the ones who are largely benefiting off of these products and we're embodying none of that harm. So, I mean, obviously this is kind of a sad subject. It's hard to talk about and kind of wrap your head around, but all I will urge you to do is just consume less. If you are going out and thinking about, oh, do I need the iPhone 18? Think about like, no, like I'm fine with my iPhone 12 or whatever. I can wait another five years or something. Just try and start thinking about where these goods are coming from. When you go to a hardware store, um, maybe, you know, pay a little extra to say buy like this wood that says it's from Michigan or something instead of saying, say buying this wood that has no label and you have no idea where it came from. Um, a lot of the ways that um, I'm, I'm going to talk, start talking about solutions now, which is a bit happier. Um, now that we've hit the low point of the talk, we can start going back up into happy talks. Um, a lot of the uh, solutions that we kind of have in our economy and in our markets are kind of like incentive based. Like, I don't know if you've heard about like shade grown coffee um, or bird friendly coffee or like buying things that are certified by Rainforest Alliance or Sustainable Palm Alliance, Oil Alliance, whatever. There's a whole bunch of these things that are called private sector trade certification standards. Um, Rainforest Alliance is maybe the best known of these. And going out of your way to pay a, a little bit more for something, for example, coffee is a great example. Did you know that coffee is actually the second most traded commodity on planet Earth after oil? Um, pretty shocking. I was shocked the first time I, I learned that. Uh, it makes sense. We all drink coffee. All around the world, everybody drinks coffee, or you know, 80% of people drink coffee. And that's a lot of people. Um, 98% of coffee is what's called sun grown, which is it's grown, they deforest the forest, they grow it in, you know, a monoculture and they grow it under the sun because it grows faster and they can produce more. However, bird friendly coffee is what's called shade grown. And so, um, this is kind of, a uh, what the landscape looks like in a shade grown coffee area. This, this area in Northwestern Peru, um, they grow a lot of coffee here in what are called chakras, um, which are basically small farms that are, uh, they're not monocultures. In this picture, you can see bananas. This tree is called Inga. There's some coffee down here in the undergrowth. Then uh, if you pan further to the right, there's oranges, there's corn, there's all kinds of, there's like probably 10 or 15 different crops grown in this chakra. And each of these chakras is owned by uh, one family or one person in a family. And so this is this is kind of a solution um, that can be implemented at a site-specific level. This is not something that we can necessarily um, force upon people, but we can uh, ideally start implementing policy globally that uh, kind of incentivizes people to not grow things in monocultures. This Two, if you have 15 crops in your farm and it's a bad year for coffee or it's a bad year for corn or potatoes, et cetera, then you have all these other 14 crops that you can rely on and sell at the local market. So this um, community um, in Northwestern Peru, where my friend Jose grew up, um, they, they have all of these different crops. It's basically just a forest. Their, their farms are basically just a forest walking through this uh, agricultural landscape um, in one morning, we were able to see like over 70 species of birds, which, you know, that's a lot more than if you go out to a cornfield and just walk around there, right? So there are a lot of um, creative ways that we can start um, kind of using um, agroforestry and incentives like those that are kind of like set by the standard standards by like Rainforest Alliance, and through bird-friendly coffee to kind of slowly start moving in uh, the right direction away from monoculture. Obviously, it's 
a big task, but you know, it takes uh, one small step at a time, right? Um, another industry that is doing a lot of good for conservation in, uh, I, I think people are getting restless, I'm almost done. Um, uh, in, in Peru is um, Brazil nuts. I'm sure you've heard of Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts actually require um, mature forests to grow. Brazil nuts are these great, huge, tall, 50 meter tall trees. They're absolute gargantuans. They're like the biggest trees in the forest. And they're only pollinated by one specific type of orchid bee that only lives in mature rainforest. So they require that um, there's mature forest to harvest Brazil nuts. So because of that, um, Brazil nuts, this, there's this Brazil nut corridor in this area of southeastern Peru where I was working. And um, all of these concessions that harvest Brazil nuts are all high quality contiguous rainforest. And so um, the nonprofit that I was working with, it's called Alliance for Sustainable Amazon. This is my friend Jose, who works for them. Uh, working with, these are called castanheiros, castanhas, the word for um, Brazil nut in uh, Spanish. Um, and he is teaching these, these farmers of Brazil nuts, the farmers, I say, you know, loosely because they are managing these huge tracts of forest that are hundreds of hectares. Um, he's teaching them how to replant young Brazil nut trees so that they can keep these forests um, regenerating and uh, you know, in use for the next generations um, and trying to promote and uh, maintain this corridor of contiguous forests uh, and agroforestry. Um, this is what a um, Brazil nut plant looks like. You've probably seen a Brazil nut before. Here's the seed and basically just plant that in the ground and, you know, the magic happens. Um, so Brazil nuts, if you're, if you are a fan of them, they're very, they're a very good, uh, crop to, or I guess product to buy, um, to kind of promote, promote, um, agroforestry. Um, I could talk about this for a long time. Like I said, uh, I hope to study this soon. Um, but, uh, the last kind of like closing thing I want to say is, you know, a lot of this is sad deforestation. We, it is bad. You know, like we need to find ways to uh, develop in a more sustainable manner. And those ways exist. Um, a lot of um, places like um, this, uh, this group, uh, Alliance for Sustainable Amazon, are doing great work to promote sustainable agriculture and agroforestry in local communities. This area of Peru, like I said, like there, most of the, the agriculture that's done there is um, these Brazil nut concessions, which are these huge tracts of primary forest and maintain, like I said, I've, I've seen like almost 400 species of birds just in this Brazil nut forest that I was surveying. So um, there is hope in South America, especially, there are huge tracts of rainforest left. It is up to us to just kind of think about how we consume um, think about how we can consume in a more responsible manner. Think about, do we really need this um, gold ring or do I really need this uh, new fancy toy? Um, and just try and support the organizations that are doing good work. Um, there's a lot of, if, if you're ever interested in donating to uh, organizations who are, you know, helping, you know, do reforestation, projects, for example, in Peru. Um, uh, I, I have been working with philanthropists in San Francisco to fund a reforestation project in southeastern Peru with this organization. Um, so, uh, you know, if you are interested in contributing to projects like that, or, um, you know, a broad range of other product projects, there are a lot of great um, organizations like this one, Alliance for Sustainable Amazon, Amazonian uh, Conservation Association. There's a nonprofit called ASIR, and there are many more. So, um, you know, consider just trying to leave a little bit less of an impact on the world. I hope that this has kind of, you know, made you think about it a little bit more than maybe you had. Um, I'm not. I'm not trying to shame 
any of you, you know, we're, we're all very much complicit um, with a lot of the things that are going on in the world, but we can all just try and be a little bit better and a little bit more informed. So, um, you know, the, uh, reforestation is happening. This, um, this uh, uh, NGO that I've been working with, Alliance for Sustainable Amazon, uh, when I went there the first time, half of it was completely deforested. And this is a picture of a capuchin monkey uh, eating fruit uh, in a, from a tree that was planted for reforestation that I took um, just six years after it was completely barren. So there is hope. Um, there's a lot we can do. And uh, yeah, um, this is Alliance for Sustainable Amazon. So uh, that's all that I have for you. Um, please check them out if you're interested and thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions? We don't have to just talk about conservation. There's a lot of cool animals too. Yes. What is your lighting system for taking photos at night of uh, <laughs> the